All right, hello everyone. This is lesson 11, and we are dealing in this section with heresy, false teaching, and sin. Um, this was a pretty detailed lesson to put together. So I want to, here's our, where we stand. Where, as you can see, we're on lesson 11 for this semester. We have, uh, what is that, five more lessons after today. And uh, then we're done. There's our disclaimer. So here we are looking at today, and as you can see, the Agape Home Fellowship logo there. This applies to all uh, those who want to partner with Agape Home Fellowship. So, uh, let's look at the origins of, of our teaching here. And we can see this in 2 Corinthians 11, 12 through 15. And what I'm doing, I will continue to do in order to undermine the claim of those who would like to claim that in their boasted mission, they work on the same terms as we do. And this is Paul's apostleship. So there were others walking around at that time claiming to be apostles. And we have the same issue today. They're walking around claiming that they're apostles. Uh, for such men are false apostles, he says. Now, and that's the same thing going on in, in uh, things that we'll discuss next week as we discuss actual heresies. Uh, they are deceitful workmen disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, their end will correspond to their deeds. So here's the origins of this, of, of heresy. The origins are Satan. The origins are uh, doctrines of demons, and I should have put that in there. It's uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I will add that to the notes. It's doctrines of demons, sowing heresies, and then you have agents of Satan who are um, acting as angels of light. Now, it's interesting in the church today, we have people who want to say that people are demons, and all of this stuff, but if you look at the scripture, the only time that we really see the scripture referring to them uh, to people directly as agents of Satan are false teachers. It's not the lost people that are agents of Satan necessarily, uh, even though they are. Uh, so I don't want to I don't want to mistake that 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 idea there uh, that lost people do act on behalf of the enemy, but when there's when we look at a scripture uh, to prove that, the scripture that really sticks out is that uh, is this Second Corinthians uh, eleven passage, where Paul is saying that you've got Satan and you've got his servants, and and who are his servants? In in context here, they are false apostles, deceitful worker, workmen, and they disguise uh, themselves as apostles of Christ. So. I think we need to focus on that rather uh, than calling uh, like some people like Greg Locke do, you know, anybody that doesn't agree with his idea of the way things should go, uh, an agent of Satan, because this is the way Paul referred to agents of Satan, people like Greg Locke. So I want to talk about, is there a difference between heresy and false teaching? And the answer is yes. So it's important to understand the definition of heresy. Because uh, heresy is not a New Testament word used by Christians, per se. It's only been used by uh, Pharisees, and, and therefore it's not a scripturally defined word. Now, there is words that are in the New Testament heretic, and, and, and there are things um, related to heresy, but a lot of times they're translated as something different than the word heresy. It depends on the uh, version you're using, honestly, uh, because uh, the word is heresis, and it means to choose the act of taking or to capture. So it, it's really not a well-defined scriptural word or concept, this idea of heresy. So we kind of have to, uh, and, and when I say it's not a well-defined uh, scriptural term, Adultery is, by the Greek word uh, pornea and, uh, for fornication. Um, there are certain things that are very well scripturally defined. You can go to one scripture and it says it right there. 
Heresy is more of a um, a cloud, if you will. It, it and not by meaning that it's kind of obscure, but you have to go to different parts of the scripture to get the the whole idea. You have to stand back and look at the whole big picture. So, what is heresy? What heresy is is a fundamental error regarding essential doctrines that impact salvific issues. Now, understand what I'm saying here. Any doctrine that impacts salvation is called an essential doctrine. We discussed this in last semester's uh, uh, pastoral theology seminar when we talked about the difference between essential doctrines and non-essential doctrines. Well, this is what defines heresy. If something impacts that fundamental essential doctrine and is teaching it falsely, then that is a heresy. So an example of this would be that, uh, like the Jehovah's Witness doctrine, that teaching that Jesus is not God, that he was not pre-incarnate. Remember in our previous semester we talked about this, about how Jesus was pre-incarnate. He is the, the Word made flesh. He is... Uh, co-equal with God. He, he existed uh, bef before the beginning of the world. He created the world. Well, Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe that. Therefore, that is a heresy that they teach. They teach that he is a created being. And in fact, they, they teach that he is uh, the archangel Michael that has basically transformed and, and was born into the body of Jesus. So, uh, here are some scriptures. But false prophets also among, arose among you, the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. So you can see who brings in uh, destructive heresies. In the Old Testament, it was false prophets, and we use that term today, false prophets, uh, and they're false teachers. And they deny the master who bought them. Notice the term bought. He bought them with his, his saving blood. So they deny him. They deny something about the essential doctrine of the faith there. Uh, and they bring upon themselves swift destruction. Now, we look also at Galatians 5, 19 and 20. I'm sorry, uh, Titus 3, 10 and 11. And we'll talk about this verse in a little bit. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject knowing that he is warped and sinful, being condemned of himself. So, uh, looking finally at Galatians 5, 19 and 20, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Those are works of the flesh. So, let me go back here, actually. So you can see that the only slight definition here about what a destructive heresy is, is denying the master who bought them. But it, the, the, the definition is actually much more broad, and we have to go um, elsewhere and kind of all tie it together because the, uh, there are other heresies besides denying Jesus. There are... Uh, other heresies that exist, and, and we could dis we'll discuss some of those. Uh, we'll actually we'll discuss some of those next week. So, false teaching. So, what separates a false teaching from a heresy? Because so many times these terms are banded about; they're they're bound together; they're they're used interchangeably, and we should not use them interchangeably. And this calls for wisdom on our part. We have to be wise when we are determining whether someone is a heretic or whether someone's a false teacher because there's a difference in how we're going to deal with those people. So a false teaching is any teaching that strays from the true, true doctrine that does not rise to the level of heresy. And there are different levels of false teaching. There can be minor levels of false teaching and major levels of false teaching. James 3, verses 1 and 2 states this, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Now, this is a, ver this is a piece of a verse that's always caused me to reflect upon myself, and this is why I am so driven about making sure I understand what I'm teaching. 
and why I'm so driven about other things. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he said, he is a perfect man, able to also bridle his whole body. Well, we know that there is no perfect man other than Jesus. And the scripture just said, we all stumble in many ways. So James, the Lord's half-brother, is including himself in this. He didn't say, for you all stumble. He said, for we all stumble. In not just one way, but in many ways. Now, what's the context here? Is he talking about just sin in general? Uh, I'm living my life, and you know, I stumble. I mess up. No. Uh, now, surely he understands that as a writer of the book of James. He understands that concept, but that's not what he's saying. Look at the, con the context. Remember, we have to stop when we're looking at a passage of Scripture. We have to stop, and we've, we've got to look at the context. So what's the context here? You should not be teachers because teachers will be judged with greater strictness. For we stumble. What do we stumble in? We stumble in what we teach. We know that Paul himself says we all look through a mirror dimly. We don't have it all together on every detail of Scripture. But yet we are told as teachers to teach every detail of Scripture. Uh, if you preach and teach long enough, Decades and decades and decades, like some of the guys that mentored me, uh, 70 years. I've, I've had pastors that mentored me who were in the pulpit or teaching in some aspect of ministry for 70 years. They have taught everything. And guess what? They even admitted, I guarantee you, I've made errors. And this is what this verse is talking about. So we have to realize that there are minor errors and there are major errors. And I have to, as I tell every pastor, and I tell you pastors, and I tell you teachers, and you watching this who want to be teachers, and I tell myself, everybody is a false teacher. Everyone is. Billy Graham's a false teacher. John MacArthur's a false teacher. Uh, you name the pastor that you like, you name the preacher that you like, and this verse says that they are a false teacher. However, here's the difference. Uh, do we uh, deal with this? Oh, I'm going backwards. I'm sorry. Uh, do we deal with this? Some, some, some teaching is, uh, is minor. And it may just be differences of, of opinion on things. So, uh, does a rapture happen at the beginning of the tribulation or the midpoint of the tribulation? That's a difference of opinion. And, and one person can look at Scripture and say, yes, for sure. And another person can look at Scripture and say, yes, for sure this way. And this is where uh, Rupertus uh, Maldinius, he, he has a famous saying. It says, in, in essentials unity and non-essentials liberty and in all things charity. In other words, in all things love. So in our essentials, we have to be totally unified as Christians. We have to be absolutely unified. We cannot um, waver. We, we have to be solid and deal with those things. Because when things attack the essentials, they are what? They're not false teaching. They are heresy. And non-essentials, we have to have some liberty. And by what he's saying by liberty is if it's a non-essential, here's the thing you've got to think about. If it's a non-essential, you and this person are brother or sister in Christ, and eventually you're going to be in heaven together. Now, there could be an issue that some false teaching is major. It still does not impact essential theology. You may not be able to have fellowship with such individuals. And this is going to vary from individual to individual and church to church. So let me just, I'm just going to poke the bear a little bit. Uh, one of these major issues for Agape Home Fellowship is women elders. Not women teachers, because Titus, we've, we've already discussed this in previous lessons. Women teachers, teaching other women, teaching children. We've, we've talked about that, but I'm talking about women in leadership authority over the church. Elder, overseer, pastor. Those, those things there. This is not a heresy. 
as much as people want to make it out to be, it's not going to affect anybody's salvation. If a woman pastor, a female pastor of a church, holds the same essential doctrines that I do, we're going to be in heaven for all eternity together. And honestly, I believe at that point she's going to see that she's wrong. But right now, she's a sister in Christ. Now, I cannot, because I believe this is a major false teaching, and I believe the enemy is using it to divide the church and other things, I cannot uh, necessarily have fellowship in terms of cooperation. I can have fellowship with such a person on an individual basis, you know, and talk to them and, and be kind to them. But I cannot have fellowship with them in terms of cooperation at the church level. In other words, Agape Home Fellowship is not going to cooperate with a church that's led by female leadership. I hope that makes sense. Because this is a major non-essential difference that we have. There are others. Uh, Sabbath keeping, for instance. Uh, not that you keep the Sabbath but that you teach that the Sabbath must, must be kept. Uh, and there are people out there that believe that the Sabbath must be kept. Now, let's say that that's as far as they go. They don't keep the law. They don't mandate keeping the law. They, that, but they just believe that Sabbath must be kept. You have to keep the Sabbath. And there are Christians who do that, like Seventh-day Adventists. Now, I believe if the essentials are the same, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. But this is a major doctrinal difference that I cannot have fellowship with as a leader of Agape Home Fellowship. I just can't marry Agape Home Fellowship with, this, with anybody that does this because it will clash with what we are teaching in our non-essentials. There are others who may teach non-essentials that uh, don't rise to that level. And it's that simple. We can have fundamental disagreements on small matters. Oh, well, he's a mid-trip rapture person. He, he pastors a church. That's fine. I don't care. We can still cooperate. I hope that makes sense. So, for, uh, 2 Timothy 2.14 says, Put them in memory of these things, charging them before the Lord not to dispute about words to, not, to no profit, to the subverting of the hearers. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.16 says, To shun, as far as false teaching, uh, to shun, and that means to turn oneself about for the purpose of avoiding something, Profane, not and pro, that word profane there means not religious talk. In other words, it's it's uh, it's it's talk that doesn't deal with our mission, our goal, what we're here on earth for. Uh, stuff that's not connected with religion. So profane doesn't mean like it's curse words. It, it means stuff that doesn't deal with why we signed up for Jesus Christ's army, so to speak. Or vain babblings, empty discussion, discussions of vain and useless matters. For they will increase to more ungodliness. So we have to put these things as elders into the memory and the mind of those who are in our congregations. That's the charge that, that we are given. And uh, because it subverts the hearers and it increases to ungodliness. Avoid foolish and unlearned questions, knowing that they give birth to strifes, 2 Timothy 2.23. Refuse profane and old womanish tales and exercise yourself to godliness, 1 Timothy 4.7. O Timothy, guard the deposit, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of falsely named science, 1 Timothy 6.20. Now, the falsely named science here is the heresy of Gnosticism. So we have the profane and vain babblings. That's what's interesting about this verse is we have profane and vain babblings. That's false teaching or that's idle talk. But then we have heresy, which is falsely named science. And that, that word there in the Greek is gnosis, and he's dealing with Gnosticism. That's a heresy that we will discuss next week. So he, he, he's telling Timothy to make sure you avoid these things. Avoid these things and avoid these people. So, Titus 1, 13 through 15. This witness is true. For which cause convict them sharply. Notice that. Convict them sharply. I, I, and I need everybody who's watching this to pay attention to the commands, the specific commands. Convict them sharply. 
so that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish myths and commandments of men, turning away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who, uh, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. So, what does that mean? To the pure, all things are pure. So, beware of legalists that call things defiled when they're not. We have a lot of that. Uh, we have a lot of legalists who say things are defiled. You know, I think of being raised in a Southern Baptist church and being told that you can't dance when so many of the, the deacons had their uh, daughters on the dance team or cheerleaders and they were out there in little short skirts and they were dancing. They had no problem with that, but yet they had a problem with some a couple getting married and dancing. That's legalism. That is exactly what this verse is speaking of. Those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. See, to those people, nothing's pure because they have made it impure in their own minds, not according to Scripture. Beware of those who try to put you under the law again, who try to call things impure when they are not, because they adhere to a certain asceticism that is traditional or cultural and not scriptural. So asceticism means I'm going to do something to make myself good, so to speak. And these are traditions or commandments of men, and they're not commandments of God. And as I always say, point it to a verse. Don't, don't grab up in the air and, and go grab something and say, well, this kind of generally applies, so therefore I'm going to make it a blanket statement. No, point me to a verse. If you're going to give me a commandment that says I can't do something or I must do something, you need to show me in Scripture. And, and you don't need to tie so many loose ends to it that it falls apart upon an examination. So let's talk about heresy. How do we deal with heresy in the body of Christ? First of all, you need to be discerning. Hebrews 5, 12-14 says that one of the reasons why heresy arises in the body of Christ is because there's a time amongst Christians that they should be teachers. They should be not just necessarily the teacher uh, of the body, but they should be able to teach others, to disciple others. But they have need that they should be taught again. The first principles of the oracles of God. In other words, these Hebrews there in Judea, they were dull. They were dull of hearing because they hadn't studied the word of God. They hadn't given themselves to study and learning. All right? And you have become in, in need of milk and not solid food. And, and we see Peter talk about this. The, the milk is the word but as we grow, we need solid food. This is, this is Paul using an analogy of a, of a growing baby. And as a, me who has a granddaughter, I've watched her transition from, you know, mother's milk and, 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 and formula. Now she's, she's growing into these solid foods. And, and I watched this with my own children as they transitioned. And of course, you know, I've got adult grown children now. Are they still on milk? Do I still fix them a bottle with formula when they're 21 and 24 years old? Do I do that? No, I don't. They can feed themselves. They eat steak. They, they eat meat because they know how to fill uh, their own requirements. This is what Paul is talking about here. For everyone partaking of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. And he's talking about adult infants here. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age. Even those who, because of use, use, they've used it, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So we have to be discerning. But the only ones who can really be discerning about heresy are those who have used their senses and exercise their senses to discern this. And the only way you can do this is being skilled in the word of righteousness, not unskilled and still on milk, but skilled and on solid food. That's what this passage is saying. So in order to be discerning, you have to be skilled and on solid food, and you have to use your senses and exercise them to determine that's good teaching, that's false teaching. 
And if you can't do that, you have to trust those who can. We need to be on guard for heresy. Acts 20, verses 29 through 31 says, For I know this, that after my departure, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Now, we, we talked about this uh, in a previous lesson about eldership. And that there, there are men going to arise from your own selves speaking perverse things in order to draw disciples away after them. This is heresy. In other words, heretics are going to arise. Therefore, watch and remember that from the time of three years did I not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. This is what an elder does. This is what someone in the ministry does. So if those of you who are watching this, in the sound of my voice, ever wonder why I get so bent around the axle, and even my wife wonders maybe sometimes why I spend hours typing on Twitter or on Facebook at night, Therefore, watch and remember that from the time of three years, I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. This is the heart of the apostle, to warn people with tears. It's not to win an argument. It's not to win a debate. It's because there are wolves. And notice what kind of wolves they are. Grievous wolves. And they will not spare the flock. What, what does a grievous wolf that's not sparing the flock do? He sends them to hell. See, this is about men's souls. This is not about us. This is about people's souls who are going to draw people away, disciples, it says, after themselves. And therefore, we are commanded to watch. In other words, we're to look out and see where this is occurring. And then we are to warn, who's it says? To warn everyone. Everyone who will listen. And sadly, the time has come, come now where this, and the scriptures come true in 2 Timothy 4. They won't listen. They don't give heed. But I still have a command, and so do you, to warn. And we're going to look more at that. Uh, 2 Peter 3.17 Therefore, beloved, knowing beforehand, beware lest being led astray with, uh, astray with the error of the lawless, you fall from your own steadfastness. So we are to beware. We are to be on guard for let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. That's Ephesians 5. Now in Philippians 3 we see, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision party. In other words, the Jews who are teaching that um, there were Jewish Christians, quote-unquote Christians at the time, who were telling people, yes, Jesus is great. Uh, the cross is great. But in order for you to really be saved, you have to be circumcised, you Gentiles. You Gentile man, you need to keep the law and be circumcised. You still need to keep the Sabbath. You still need to keep the festivals. You still need to keep all of these things that Acts 15 and the Jerusalem Council said you, did, you don't need to keep. These people had worked their way in. They were what Paul called dogs. They were evil workers. And, and Paul is telling the leaders of the church at Philippians, right? The elders and the deacons. He's telling them to beware. And that word beware means, as, as you can see there, to discern mentally, to observe. So we've got to make sure we're paying attention. To perceive, to, disco to, perceive, discover, and understand. You've got to pay attention. If you're a leader in the church, you have a obligation to pay attention to what's going on. And then you have an obligation to expose it. Ephesians 5.11 Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that word reprove means to find fault with and correct. In other words, you find... Because I've had numerous people when I've tried to correct heresy in the church. And I'm not talking about minor false teaching. I'm talking about heresy. That I've had people actually tell me, you're a fault finder. Well, guess what? Okay, and you know what? From now on, I'm going to say, yes, I am. You're right. Because Ephesians 5.11 tells me to be a fault finder. It tells me to find fault. And then correct. 
I'm not going to apologize for what the Lord in all of these scriptures that I've given you. How many have I given you so far? Almost a dozen. And I've got plenty more to go that, command, that commands us to do these things. Why should we apologize for doing what God tells us to do? Because it makes people uncomfortable? Because they don't like it? Speak these things. That's a command. It's not an insinuation. It's not a if you want to. It's a command. Speak these things. Things regarding salvation and holy living uh, from verse 12 and 13. That's in Titus 2.15. And exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. In other words, don't let anyone get in your way. Don't let anyone, Titus, hold you back. If someone gets in your way, roll them over, in other words. Speak these things, and in the context, he was talking about things regarding salvation and holy living. Exhort, in other words, lift them up, but if they won't listen, rebuke them. With every bit of authority you can muster. Because this is, again, serious business. See, I don't think people understand that this is serious business. This deals with men's eternal salvation. This deals with where people end up for all eternity. This isn't about winning an internet argument. This isn't about winning a personal debate. This determines where people end up for the rest of time. Do they end up with our Father in Heaven or do they end up in Hell? That to me, as someone who's been called by God, is fairly important. And I take the, the calling of God very seriously. The sad part is, is that too many people do not take the calling of God seriously. And so they don't really care. They say they care. They say they care if people end up in hell. But they don't care enough to put themselves out there to rebuke false teachers, even though they see them. They don't care enough to stand up and say, you know what, don't listen to them for this reason. Why? Because they're afraid of being not their friend anymore. They're afraid of something temporary rather than something eternal. And for that, I say they don't love people. And they don't maybe don't even love their God the way they should. We are con to contend with heretics. 1 Corinthians 15.32 says, what do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with the beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Now, we already saw that when he was talking to Ty, uh, Timothy at Ephesus in, in, in 1 Timothy 6, he was talking about the so-called science. He was talking about Gnostics. Well, what do I gain, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. This is symbolic language. He didn't fight actual beasts. He didn't, he didn't get in there at Ephesus and fight lions. All right. He, he didn't fight tigers and bears, oh my. He fought, what this is teaching, he is calling the false teachers of Ephesus, the Gnostics, beasts. We are to follow Paul and follow Peter, and follow the apostles. We are to contend with heretics. And we are to look at them the same way what Paul has already said. They are, they are agents of Satan. They are his agents. Right? They are his servants. In other words, they are beasts. They are devils. And Paul fought with them. He didn't engage them in a kind discourse and when they couldn't come together just say okay god bless you no he fought because see this is a life and death struggle because he was worried about the church at ephesus he wasn't worried about the beasts he, he wasn't worried about hurting their feelings he was worried about the saints at ephesus are they going to get led astray and get sent to hell because they are following the beasts so that's my question to you who are you worried about are you worried about yourself or are you worried about the church? We are to contend. What do I gain? We saw that, okay? Uh, for there are indeed many unruly men. This is Titus 1, 10, and 11. Vain talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Again, we have this issue of the Jews and in them teaching you've got to be under the law again at this time. And guess what? We had this rising again today. We're going to talk about that next week. We have this rise of people putting 
trying to put people back under the law. I dealt with this literally, I guess about two months ago, uh, with, with people who were trying, who are teaching here in, in my little corner of Northeast Tennessee, trying to put people back under the law, saying you've got to observe the law, every aspect of it, okay? Whose mouth you must stop who subvert whole houses, teaching things, and not for the sake of ill, and not, they teach, sorry, teaching things not right for the sake of ill gain. See, that's their, that's their, uh, their reasoning. Their reasoning is that for profit. It's greed. It always is, right? It's, uh, it's always money. And we see that today with these false prophets, these false teachers, these heretics. But look what happens. Unruly men, vain talkers, deceivers. And then he just says, especially of what's going on there with you in, in, in Crete, Titus, especially those of the circumcision. But we have others that are heretics today that aren't of the circumcision. They're of a different brand. They're Gnostics. New Age that has crept into the church. And we'll talk about that next week. What does he tell Titus to do? You've got to shut them up. You've got to shut them up. Why? Because they subvert whole houses. In other words, whole households are going to hell. They were following the course of Christ, but now they're going to hell because they are being deceived. And if you're in a position of leadership, that should bother you. But what I see out in my country right now is quiet pulpits of people who don't mention a blessed thing about these false teachers that are subverting whole households. And they have a pulpit to do it. And they're online. Many of them are online. There are some who are doing it. But there are also, for every one that's doing it, there's 20 or 30 who are not. Or maybe 50 who are not. They would rather try to get you to give more money for the church building than call out a false teacher. And if anyone does not obey our word by this letter, mark that one and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. So how do we deal with heresy and heretics? How do we deal with them? We've seen why we should deal with them, because it's commanded. But how do we deal with them is the question. How do we do it? Well, this is how. We mark them and have no company with them, that they may be ashamed. This is really the first, th these two verses are the first two steps. Yet do not count his, uh, him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now, we add to that Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. After the first and second warning. Okay, so now we, we're going to go back to 2 Thessalonians, Thessalonians 3, 15. We are admonishing him as a brother, right? For the first and second warning. I hope this is clicking. So, the person is not obeying the word of this letter. In other words, they're not obeying the doctrine. And the doctrine in 2 Thessalonians is salvific. It's essential. So these people are not obeying essential doctrine. They're teaching false things. We are to mark them, have no company with them, so that they would be ashamed. In other words, that's immediate. But we still treat them as a brother. And then the other command here is you go to them and we warn them. We say, hey, this is wrong. And here's why it's wrong. Here's the scripture. And then they're going to, if they reject you, you give them another chance. And maybe you go with more people. You go with more ammunition. You, you go with more scripture. And you still treat them as a brother. In other words, you still assume that they're a brother in Christ. If they reject you again, you're rejecting, notice what it says, a man of heresy. Two warnings, that's it. Reject a man of heresy, knowing that he who is such has been perverted and sins being self-condemned. So after the first and second warning, reject. Now what does that word reject mean? It means to avert by entreaty or seek to avert to refuse, to dec uh, decline, to shun, avoid. 
Galatians 1, 6 through 9 is probably the most pronounced. All right? Uh, I marvel that you so soon are becoming moved away from him who called you into gra the grace of Christ to another gospel, which is not another. In other words, there's, there's only one gospel. There's, there's one way. There's not many gospels. There's not many good newses. There's one good news. The good news that, that, that Jesus Christ died on the cross was a, a, uh, was a, a died on the cross for our sin and that he uh, took his sin upon us, all right, and that he rose again. And that if we place our faith in him and, and change our way of thinking, that that saves us, okay? That's a quick and dirty of the gospel. But... There's not another gospel. In other words, there's not this other gospel that says, yeah, we can add to this. We can say, yeah, we can, we can, we can believe in that, but you've got to add circumcision. You've got to add keeping the Sabbath. Because if you don't keep the Sabbath, then this doesn't work. Okay? That's the other gospel in this particular instance he's talking about. But many people teach another gospel today. They say, yeah, we believe Jesus is good. Yeah, if this, way is, this method is good. But you, you've also, this method works too. Uh, Islam, this method works. Or, or Hinduism, this method works. And in the case of Roman Catholics, yeah, this is good, but unless you do all of this other stuff, you don't get to go to heaven. You're going to go to purgatory, and you've got to have certain things to get you out. So that's another gospel. And, it's, but, and he says, but some are troubling you, desiring to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven, in other words, some angel, some supernatural being shows up and preach a gospel to you besides what we preach to you, let them be accursed. As we said before, and now I say again, if anyone preaches a gospel to you besides what you have received, let him be accursed. Now that word accursed is, and in some translations you'll actually see it, anathema. This is a very powerful Greek word. It means a thing devoted to God without hope of being redeemed. In other words, there is no hope here. And if, it, if it's an animal, it's to be slain. So this word accursed, you could say an animal was accursed. And that means that it was going to be killed. But if it's dealing with a person, it's something that's a person that's doomed to destruction. So in other words, anyone who preaches another gospel besides the gospel that we have in the scripture is doomed to destruction and without any hope of being redeemed. It's that simple. I exhort you, brothers, to watch, in other words, to fix your eyes upon or direct your attention to those making divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For they are such that do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches, they deceive the hearts of the simple. See, false teachers are angels of light, as we have seen. They use good words and they use good speeches. They're very good at what they do. All right? But, again, we have a command. We are to fix our eyes and direct our attention to those making these divisions and avoid them. We're to absolutely avoid these type of people. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Now I command you. Notice all the commands. Notice the command, I exhort you. I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. I, and then when we get to 2 Thessalonians, he's just flat out saying, I command you. This is a commandment. So church, this is a commandment. Brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he's saying, I'm not saying it. Jesus is saying it that you withdraw yourself from every brother who walks disorderly and not after the teaching which he received from us. In other words, if it's not if he's not following the doctrine that we have laid out, the gospel, if they're not following that and they have fallen away into something else, you withdraw yourself from them. It's it's almost like a shark is swimming up through a school of fish and you've probably seen that on, on television. You've got a school of fish, and that's the church, that's the congregation, and this shark swims up. What do the fish do? Do they stay there? No, they avoid. They make a giant hole. 
That's what the church is to do. But unfortunately today, the church likes to sit around and fellowship with the shark. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing. He is sick concerning doubts and arguments, from which comes envy, strife, evil speakings, evil suspicions, meddling of men whose minds have been corrupted and deprived of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. So, we are to what? What's the very last three words? Withdraw from such. We are to withdraw from people teaching false doctrine because it, 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 it genders envy, strife, and they have evil speakings and evil suspicions. And that word withdraw means to make a standoff, to cause to withdraw, to remove, to excite, to revolt, to stand off, to desert, to withdraw from a person, to again shun, to flee from them. If anyone teaches something that is not consistent with true doctrine, essential doctrine, you're to withdraw from them. Period. Here's an example. I, I, I didn't want to leave you without showing you examples of how this was enacted in Scripture. This charge I commit to you, my son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before you in order that you might war a good warfare by them. Notice, this is not patty cake. This is not, uh, when it comes to defending doctrine, this is not gentle at times. This is war. And Paul uses that word twice in, in a span of four words. War a good warfare. Fight a good fight. Holding faith and a good conscience, which by which some have put away and made shipwreck as to their faith. In other words, if they've made shipwreck their faith, this is dealing with essential doctrine. This is dealing with things that affect salvation. Among these are Hymenaeus and Alexander. So what happened is these two men are teaching false heretical doctrine that are shipwrecking the faith of some. They're not just dealing with themselves. They just they didn't have a change of mind and kept it to themselves. No, they are in Ephesus, and they're probably teaching some form of Gnosticism because these are Greek names. So they're teaching some form of Gnosticism in the church. They tried to, uh, Paul obviously tried to correct them. They wouldn't listen. So what happened? Whom I have delivered to Satan so that they may learn not to blaspheme. That's how you deal with it. So this is Paul the Apostle who had a revelation and was directly taught by Jesus Christ himself and he delivers these false teachers over to Satan. Now, what is the disciple that Jesus loved? The one who put his head on Jesus' breast and loved on Christ. What does he do? You think John, oh, he's so loving, he's so kind. He's not Paul. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes Again, as we talk about, Diotrephes is the only single pastor in the entire New Testament. It is the only time that you're going to see a single pastor running the show in the entire New Testament. That's the reason why we at Agape Home Fellowship have a plurality of elders that govern everything. Not one person who loves to have the preeminence among them did not receive us. In other words, he thought he was so important that he, would, he was not receiving John the Apostle, and those other elders who are accompanying John. Therefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he does, ranting against us with evil words, and not content with these, neither does he himself receive the brothers. In other words, he's not going to receive anybody. He, he's a one-man show. It's all about him. And he is. And we have this going on today. But... Uh, and he forbids those who would and cast them out of the church. In other words, there were back in this day, there were traveling brothers, traveling evangelists, traveling teachers. And, and this is where we talked last week about the gift of hospitality. Well, he would not allow the church to be hospitable to these traveling elders, these traveling teachers. And if somebody was hospitable, to these guys, he would throw them out of the congregation because he didn't want anybody coming in and teaching 
anything other than what he taught. That sounds very familiar to almost, I'm not going to say every church today, but most congregational government churches today, they don't want anybody coming from the outside telling them what to do at all. They don't. They'll throw you out, or they'll make it so uncomfortable that you leave. Beloved, do not imitate the bad, but the good. He who does good is from God, but he who does evil has not seen God. So, just remember what John says. When he comes, he's going to have words with Diotrephes. He's going to set him straight. So, finally, I want to sum up with dealing with sin in the body. I'm not going to read this entire passage. Most everybody knows it. Uh, how do you deal with sin? First of all, we need to keep a warning. Everybody stops at John, I'm sorry, at Matthew 7, verse 1. Judge not that ye be not judged. And then they stop. They stop reading. They don't read it in context. Um, they forget to go down where it says, First cast the beam out of your own eye, and then you shall see clearly to cast the splinter out of your brother's eye. In other words, Jesus is not teaching here that we should not judge our brother. He is not saying, yeah, your brother's got a splinter in his eye, and if it's left there, it's going to blind him. But guess what? You're not allowed to look at your brother's eye, so just go on about your merry little way. He's not saying that. He's saying, how can you look at your brother's eye when you got a sawdust full of, you got an eye full of sawdust yourself? You can't see correctly. Make sure your eye is clear. Make sure you are not guilty of that sin, and then you can go up and pick that speck out. That's what he's saying. Uh, but verse 6 says, Do not give that which is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again to tear you. That, see, that's very important with judging. Because we don't want to give that which is holy to the dogs. In other words, if somebody's not going to allow you to be judged, uh, to is allow you to judge them, uh, don't give that that's holy to the dogs. So if someone's going to, if someone is deep in sin, and let's say it's the sin of uh, adultery, or let's say it's a, a, just name it, and you try to correct them and say, hey, brother or sister, you shouldn't be doing this, and they say, do not judge that you not be judged. Well, and they know you're not doing that sin. And then you try to correct them and try to explain this to them, and they won't hear you. Do not give that which is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine. So what Jesus is basically calling that person is a dog and a pig. Because what they're going to do is try to, they're going to take your good words and your good work that you're trying to do, which is trying to keep them from going blind, and they're going to turn that around and take the, that word and take your good efforts and they're going to trample it under their feet and they're going to turn about and they're going to tear you to pieces. That's what Jesus is saying. So that's a warning. The warning is to be prepared to be torn to pieces, but first make sure you don't have a, a, an eye full of sawdust. So another warning. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.14 We exhort you, brothers, to warn, admonish, rebuke those who are unruly, in other words, disorderly. Now, this is a great Greek word, the word unruly here. And it, it appeals to me because it's a military word. And so many times Paul used military terms. It means out of ranks. And it was used, as soldier, used of soldiers. In other words, you're in formation as a body of Christ. And here you are, you're in formation, and you're marching, and you're doing things. And all of a sudden, you've got one guy or gal who, who just wants to do their own thing. One man or lady who just wants to do their own thing. They don't want to march to the, to the beat of what we're called to march to, the rhythm we're called to. They want to do their own thing. That's unruly. They're out of rank. They're out of order. Well, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to warn them, admonish them, rebuke them. And I have actually done this. When, when I was in the military, and also when I was in the Corps of Cadets at A&M, both times when we were in formation and people were supposed to be standing at attention. Standing at attention is your arms are down to your side. You are staring straight ahead. You're not talking. 
You're looking straight ahead. You're not even supposed to smack a, a mosquito if it's chewing on your cheek. You're supposed to let that thing fill with blood and fly off. You're not to move. But there were numerous times uh, over the course of my 32 years when uh, people would be in ranks and they would be standing at attention and they would be looking around maybe and I'd have to say, hey, you're at attention. And this was especially when I was in the Corps Cadets at A&M. You're at attention. You're not at, at, at parade rest. You're not at ease. You're at attention. In other words, you're disorderly. You're out of ranks. And so that's the way we are supposed to be at the church. If somebody is out of ranks, we are supposed to admonish and rebuke them. We are to notice the different levels here. We are to comfort the faint-hearted. We are to support the weak. We are to be patient towards all. So even in our warning, we are to be patient. 2 Corinthians 10.6 Having readiness to avenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now that's a very interesting verse. You should be ready to avenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So what's disobedience? It's unwillingness to hear. That's what the Greek word means. So when you have heard and you're obeying, you've got to be ready to avenge all disobedience. In other words, people who are not willing to listen, you've got to be ready to avenge. Well, what does that word avenge mean? It doesn't mean to take vengeance upon like, like we think it means. It means to protect, to defend one person from another. We, As we go back and look at the other verses, what's this about? This is about protecting the flock. This is about protecting and defending the others from the person who is disobedient. It's about protecting the obedient from the disobedient. That's what this verse is speaking of. So, I'm not going to read the entire passage of 1 Corinthians 5, but this is a very important uh, verse on church discipline. I wrote to you, and this is starting in verse 9, I wrote to you not to associate intimately with fornicators, yet not altogether the fornicators of this world. In other words, he, I'm not talking to you, Paul says, about lost fornicators, lost adulterers, lost people living in sin, or with the covetous, or the extortioners, or idolaters. In other words, I'm not talking to you about idol worshipers who aren't saved. Uh, because then you must go... Uh, you, for then you must go out of the world. In other words, if if I told you not to keep up or uh, keep in contact with those people, you wouldn't be able to go out, out into the world. But I have now written to you not associate intimately if any man is called a brother. In other words, they say I'm a Christian and is either a fornicator, covetous, an idolater, a reviler, and that means somebody who calls other people's names. They They... They, they slander people's character. They're, not, they're, a, they're, they're a name caller. A drunkard, an extortioner, with such a one not even to eat. And the eating there was the high meal of the day. And it was a very, in this culture, it was very intimate. All right? Uh, when you wouldn't eat with somebody, and, and there's still cultures in the Middle East like this today. If you, would, if you won't eat with somebody, uh, that means you're really shunning them. Uh, for what is it to me to also judge those who are outside? In other words, outside the church. Do you not judge those who are inside? God judges those who are outside. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil one. So, what this is saying is, we are not the judge of the lost people. We are the judge of the people in the church, the, the ones who call themselves Christians. And if they are doing things, and this is not an all-encompassing list, obviously, but if they are doing things that bring discredit or dishonor to the church, which is what was happening in the first, uh, this is why he wrote this, because what was happening in the first couple of verses of 1 Corinthians was a man was having uh, sexual relations with his father's wife. In other words, he was having sexual relations with his stepmother. And We are, t any of those kind of sins, and maybe others that you can think of, that are public and bringing discredit 
to the church and causing Jesus Christ to look bad to the lost people, we have to judge that. But if your brother shall trespass against you, you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, you take one or two more with you. And I presume that these should be elders. All right? You should take your church elders with you. So that in the mouth of two or three witnesses may a word be established. And if he shall neglect to hear him, you tell it to the entire church or the congregation. If he neglects to hear the congregation, let him be with you as a heathen and a tax collector. Truly I say to you that whatever you shall bind on earth shall occur having been bound in heaven. And whatever you shall loose on earth shall occur, having been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two or three of uh, you shall agree on earth as regarding anything that, that they ask, it shall be done by them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. All right. So this is the church discipline as far as sin goes. And it's pretty self-explanatory. You, you go and you try to deal with things privately if it's a, it's a matter between you and your brother. If it's, uh, and then if they won't hear you, then you take other elders with you or other witnesses. And if they won't hear that, then you've got, this is why I would say you get the elders involved, because then they can bring that before the church, the congregation. And if they still say, basically, go pound sand, I don't care that I've sinned against my brother. Uh, I'm not going to repent for it. They, they should be shunned, as 1 Corinthians 5 states. All right, so let's conclude this. One of the responsibilities of being an elder, a shepherd, a pastor, an overseer, or a bishop, over the Lord's flock is the responsibility of maintaining doctrinal purity. And this necessitates the need that we call out heresy, false teaching, and sin. All right? Um, we have to do these things. This We do these things, we call out heresy, false teaching, and sin to protect the flock, to protect the body of Christ. And I want to recall your memory back to the fact that the word avenge means to protect and defend one person from another. So you are protecting the flock, both these young sheep and, and the more mature sheep, from ravenous, grievous wolves that are sent to devour them through their heretical doctrine and their sinful destruction destructive lifestyles. You are called to do this. You are commanded to do this by the Lord. And I'm just going to be honest with you. If you cannot fulfill this obligation, if you cannot do this, because this is one of the primary jobs, the primary obligations of the pastor, of the elder, uh, teaching, praying, uh, discipling, and protecting the flock from these wolves. That is, if you can't do this, you do not belong in the position of being an elder, an overseer over the, the Lord's body. That's just the bottom line. So as we conclude, there's our question and answers. Uh, remember, the test is due on the 20th of April. And I'll conclude with this verse. Now we exhort you, brothers, that you warn, well, again, which means admonish and rebuke, those who are unruly, disorderly, out of ranks, and comfort the faint-hearted, support the weak, and that in all this we must remember patience. And it is very hard when you're dealing with false teachers who do come at you, by the way. When you start rebuking false teachers, they will come at you like a ravenous wolf. That ravenous wolf nature will be revealed, trust me. I've seen it probably hundreds of times in my personal experience over 30 years of ministry in dealing with this, they will turn from their kind-hearted self and they will become ravenous. They will become the, the, the servant of Satan that they really are. And that, that wolf tendency that is buried will be revealed on you and they will try to devour you. So be prepared. So the next lesson... Um, we're going to actually talk about common heresies. We're actually going to look at uh, what are common heresies that affect salvation today. Now, we're going to have a, a totally separate class on common heresies and get more into detail in common heretics today, common false teachers, heretics today. Uh, there's just too much to deal with in, in this class here. 
But we're going to look at the common heritage, uh, common heresies and their origins and some uh, quote-unquote Christian religions that, that do the, uh, that are surround these heresies or, or make up these heresies. And also uh, just some common heresies that are flowing through the body of Christ. And I'm, I'm going to hit the highlights of it uh, right now. And as I said, we'll discuss more of that later at a later time. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved.